It's really hard to talk about where you think we're doing good because of Kiwi tall poppy syndrome, you know, like I'm really aware of that. And the second thing, which is probably even more um, significant, is, is I'm, I'm really scared that if you talk about it, you'll jinx it. Um, you know what I mean? And I, I think that's an angle. Is, 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 is that an Anglican thing, jinxing? I mean, is that part of our canons? T- is, that, is that appropriate? No, I'm sure. Okay. So, um, so I just want to go through, though. And this is the this is stuff that I've seen over the last few years, which I th- actually think we can take some joy in that, that God has been doing this stuff in partnership with us. And so I'm just going to go through this. And again, as soon as you put up a list, there's a whole lot of other stuff that I could have put up. And, and at the end of this list, actually, I'm going to give you opportunity to tables for one minute to add to this list of what you're seeing, okay? So put the list up. Here we go. There's two pages. First one is this. Our team training days across the diocese, I think our last training day, we found out that we had 80% of the parishes represented. That is amazing. For, you know, 80% of the parishes represented. And I think probably... Um, if you count up the amount of people there, it's nearly 5% of any given Sunday attendance. That is huge. When I explain to people in other, uh, other dioceses, other provinces, what's happening at our team training days and the amount of buy-in, uh, people cannot believe it. And so I think it's a great sign of what's happening. Uh, next thing is the alignment between governance, management, and leadership. Um, I think we've done a lot of great work on this in the last few years. And actually, you know, um, we have really good alignment. We don't have politics between any of those groups. We're all in this. We're all rowing together, and it is actually it's a real privilege to be part of it. And so I do just want to say this is significant that we have these three aligned well. Um, we've put a lot of work into um, leadership development clusters this year, and so I think between me, Jen, and Ellie, was probably around 16 different clusters, so probably 70 or 80 people uh, we've been journeying with closely, and I want to say it's really fruitful, at least in the north of the diocese where I can speak to uh, in our meetings, and um, it's really good meetings, and often we come away saying that was such a good use of time, and it's building um, support, collegiality, and developmental, and I think um, it has been really significant, and it will be even more significant, and, and I want to say that we should be proud of what's happened there. Uh, Motion 7, I mean, Neil's already stood up and done a wonderful job of actually uh, role modelling why uh, it's this, you know, why it's so great. Uh, What's happened here is, you know, uh, Neil stands up, uh, Richard bring, you know, says to Neil, hey, here's a few things I think we should think about. Together they negotiate um, what they think is most useful for us to, to help this journey go forward. And I think we should be, again, we should recognise that the Motion 7 at General Synod, which, which you know, potentially has been uh, uh, you know, quite problematic for many years and quite challenging for us as a church to wrestle with. Actually, you know, we've done all right. We've done all right moving forward. And we should notice that. We should notice that we're actually, we, we've actually, as we always hoped, that we would come out of this conversation actually stronger in our relationships to each other and stronger in our ability to hear each other's voices. We should actually recognize we, that actually that's quite remarkable and that God has done something in, in us. Not that God has changed maybe our theological perspectives, but God maybe has deepened our love for each other and our desire to actually be on mission together. And, and I, I do want to say, you know, it is, a, it is a pleasure and a privilege to have walked in this diocese through the Motion 7 conversation. And I know that there's pain on both sides, I know that, but actually we are role modelling something quite significant in going forward here, and I just want to acknowledge it, acknowledge it, because it is special, it is very special. Um, earlier this year, we had the uh, we had the diaconate uh, ordination service at the cathedral, and again, we've just re-energised in the diaconate and, and and reimagining it, saying we if we are going to be successful uh, for the kingdom of God going forward, mission is central, and the diaconate leads us forward into mission. I mean, Caro has been a classic example here in this in this school, and as she led the worship, etc., but being classically in the mission field of this school, leading us forward, and this whole idea of rebirth and diaconate. Even since that service, we've had numerous people come up to us and say, hey, I really feel like God might be calling me to be a deacon, to lead the church forward in mission. And that's really exciting. That's really exciting. Um, we've done a lot of great stuff around the housing over the last few years, and, and going forward we'll do some more. But again, we should just acknowledge that, that, that uh, we as a diocese have been involved in this issue and continue to be involved in this issue, and that has been significant. 
and we're just down the road obviously from uh, from Nainai and maybe some of us will visit there later on hear about the housing projects there and what's been involved there but again we should just take note and realise that this is something significant for us that we've been involved with. Um, in the last few years, Anklin Youth Movement uh, has significantly grown across our diocese. Now, yeah, as of all these things, there's, some fr there's always fragility, but there's amazing growth and amazing faithfulness of people, um, leaders standing up and, and, and taking responsibility, and we're fa thankful for that. Last year, we at Synod, we, we challenged dioceses to consider, uh, sorry, parishes to consider um, actually trying to grow by 5%. And overwhelmingly, across a diocese, parishes said yes. Now, now, why did we do that? Well, why we did that was because we want to say really clearly that the nature is, of God is to flourish the people on earth. The nature of God is to flourish his kingdom. The nature of God is to call people to him. That is the very nature of God. So God actually wants our parishes to grow. And we partner with God in that endeavor. And so for us, by saying, hey, let's, be, let's actually expect God to grow this, then what it actually means is we therefore say, so if we're not growing, what maybe is the invitation to change? What is that invitation? Because the nature of God in partnership with his people is to grow things. And so the 5% was just because it's purely because I'm a competitive bishop. The early church did 4%. I think we can do better, so I said 5%. That's completely, are we shameless there? I'm competitive. Um, but actually, it's not about the 5%. But what it is about saying is we actually want to do whatever it takes in our local context to partner with God to see this flourish. And it just gives us a mechanism to say, what needs to change here? And actually, in, in fairness, I think... Uh, numerous parishes now are starting to turn around. And I think we should celebrate that. I think there are more parishes growing now than five years ago. You know, now again, still, we've got work to do, long way to go, but let's celebrate the fact that actually parishes, some parishes that weren't growing before are actually growing now. That is amazing. I do not believe the narrative that we are managing slow decline because that minimizes the fact of my belief in a transforming God who turns up time and time again right through the history of this world. Next page. The font's got smaller. <laughs> oh, all my eyesight's got worse, one or the other. Um, the refugee work that we've done in this diocese, um, supporting the housing of refugees. And did you notice that the, the government, has, the coalition government has come out with increasing the quota to 1,500 now? And we, we, yeah, that's great, eh? And again, we should recognise that we have been part of that movement to raise that quota. Now, you know, us and Amnesty International and, and Murdoch and a whole lot of other people across this country, but we, were, we are part of that movement. And that we, again, should, should just acknowledge that, that God has been working in us, and it is a remarkable journey. So in the future, there's going to be 500 more because of our part and other people working to partner with God in that endeavour. Um. We're having a wonderful time having two bishops, you know? It's great. And, and what's really um, wonderful ab ab about that is that both of us in our context are committed to role modeling at the grassroots um, the very nature and journey of our church at the moment. So, so Ali has, has, has planted herself in, in, in Kilburn around the university and is, is, a, is a there with, with young adult leaders and is attempting to, again, see the church um, renewed in that area and role modeling that at the grassroots. And then um, we're having some crazy great times in Whanganui. We've just, um, we're trying to replant the church next door to us. It's church planting. It's just fun. But what's great is, is actually we're not, we're saying as bishops, look, we're on this journey at the grassroots, just like you are in your context, and we're all doing it together. And I actually think that's a real um, wonderful uh, strength of this diocese, and we, again, it's good to celebrate it. Um, you've already seen the, the um, Better World video with, with uh, uh, Guy. Guy, uh, have you changed clothes since that video? Have you been wearing the same clothes for the last five months? <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Um, 
But that, that symbolizes a partnership with CMS and our diocese, which is fruitful. Um, partly a guy in summer and the Better World Gap Year, etc. But also it's, uh, it's Anna Fletcher and the Intercultural Community Enabler. Both of them are partnerships with CMS, where we are working with CMS in our diocese to see God's kingdom come. And this is exciting what's happening there. Um, we have done significant work. You know, our culture of family discipleship and the care for the last, lost, and least is embedded. You know, and, and people sort of, you know, people sort of bandy around words, but actually, they're not just words now. We actually are living it, and it's our frame of reference, and it's, and it's embedded in every culture uh, context in the diocese. And, and I want to say that's, that's significant work. That is significant work that we've done there, and it's fruitful work. More than that, though, um, we actually have done a lot of work around our missions, values, and strategies. Now, I'm not going to replay that now, but you can get uh, access to the video that of the pre-Synod regional meetings where me and Bishop Ali went through just all the strategy and vision stuff that we're living into. And so I've been assured by Duncan that by Thursday it'll be available on movement. So if you want to see that, um, you know, it just got better, by the way. If you went to one of the first pre-Synod regional meetings, just by the time I've done it four times, me and Ali have done it four times, it was phenomenal. <laughs> Okay, so, but again, what is good about it is it's not just words, we're actually doing it. There's, we, we actually do what we say in this diocese. And so can I encourage you to actually look at that strategy and vision stuff and to, to go through it again and again and again. Because I think, again, as a diocese, we should be proud of, of how we're going there. Proud in a positive sense. That actually, we do move together. And it is impactful. Um, we've been talking about discipleship over five years, and it is, uh, it is embedded. 3DM, Casio, EFM, Anglican Studies. Um, again, there is just so many people got, uh, in one of those vehicles for discipleship. Just the other weekend, again, there was another 3DM learning community in Taranaki, which some of our people went through to. We are, the engine room of discipleship is just cranking away in our diocese behind, you know, behind closed doors, just in the back room, and, and vestries, you know, the amount of vestries now that, that pray together, that eat together, that, that read God's word together, it, it's, it's, it's changing, absolutely changing, and again, we should thank God for that. Um, last year, I was overseas, and it's probably why it was so good, but I understand the ordination service was just phenomenal in the cathedral, and, and, and it kind of that sense of vitality and life, and this year, again, we're combining the, the ordination service with a Thanksgiving service in the cathedral, where we're saying, every parish, you've got things to be thankful for. Come to the ordination service, and come bringing your things that you are thankful for, so that together we can celebrate those things, and I think last year, I, I heard the ordination service was just incredibly colourful and rich with with the spirit of God just just reeking over the whole place it was just amazing and I had uh, FOMO uh, because I wasn't there final one I just want to um, recognize is this is everywhere me and Bishop Ali go in this diocese we just find lay and ordained leaders who are so courageous who are leading out in, in a costly way and, and, and we're really thankful for that like, like you go to these, you go to parishes which, which are not big, but the hearts of the leadership are huge. And what their, uh, their, their sense of call and what they're investing in is amazing. And can I say, it is a privilege, it is a privilege to be in this diocese with the leadership that we have at the grassroots, the flax roots, lay and ordained. Now, I'm just going to leave you there and give you one minute now to just locate at your tables, before I close with a story, locate at your tables, what else in your context can you say that you're thankful for, that you can recognize in the last few years that actually God has been turning up and things are different. Give you one minute, and then I want to close with a story. Go. Okay. Just want to... Um, uh, finish with a story that I've asked uh, Caleb. I've asked Caleb to uh, read. Caleb, I appreciate you reading the story, especially since you've just flown back from the UK and the funeral of your uh, grandmother. So, appreciate that you're jet lagged and that you've agreed to read the story. Um, 
a few months ago, as I was sitting and starting to reflect upon Synod, um, God, uh, I think it was God, or it could have been the coffee, probably was the coffee, let's say it was the coffee, um, but I really felt like I wanted to, us to just reflect on this story, and it's a story I hadn't thought about for uh, many, many years. I don't know about you, but my age was is that Sunday morning when I was a child, we used to get up really early and watch, uh, listen to RNZ, whatever that was at the time, and, and listen to s- stories. Yeah. And I just, the story came back to me, and I just thought it'd be lovely if we read the story, and then we thought, what might God want to say to us through the story? Now, again, when I was a child of five or six, I wasn't church going, and I kind of just couldn't quite get the story. You know what I mean? I couldn't quite get it. Uh, and so years later, just literally a couple of months ago, I just picked it up again and reread it. And so just ask Caleb to read the story. And then after the story, I'm going to put some questions up on the, on the screen. And then in your tables or in twos or threes, if you just discuss those questions, and then after a few minutes of that, um, we'll sort of go to, we'll go to morning tea. Um, so the story is called uh, The Selfish Giant by Oscar Wilde. Are you sitting comfortably? (laughs) Then I'll begin. Every afternoon as they were coming from school, the children used to go and play in the giant's garden. It was a large, lovely garden with soft green grass. Here and there over the grass stood beautiful flowers like stars. And there were twelve peach trees that in the springtime broke out into delicate blossoms of pink and pearl, and in the autumn bore rich fruit. The birds sat on the trees and sang so sweetly that the children used to stop their games in order to listen to them. How happy we are here, they cried to each other. One day, the giant came back. He had been to visit his friend, the Cornish ogre, and had stayed with him for seven years. After the seven years were over, he had said all that he had to say, for his conversation was limited, and he determined to return to his own castle. When he arrived, he saw the children playing in the garden. What are you doing here? He cried in a very gruff voice, and the children ran away. My own garden is my own garden, said the giant. Anyone can understand that, and I will allow nobody to play in it but myself. So he built a high wall all round it and put up a notice board, trespassers will be prosecuted. He was a very selfish giant. The poor children had now nowhere to play. They tried to play on the road, but the road was very dusty and full of hard stones, and they did not like it. They used to wander round the high wall when their lessons were over and talked about the beautiful garden inside. How happy we were there! they said to each other. Then the spring came, and all over the country there were little blossoms and little birds. Only in the garden of the selfish giant, it was still winter. The birds did not care to sing in it, as there were no children, and the trees forgot to blossom. Once, a beautiful flower put its head out from the grass, but when it saw the notice board, it was so sorry for the children that it slipped back into the ground again and went off to sleep. The only people who were pleased were the snow and the frost. Spring has forgotten this garden, they cried, so we will live here all the year round. The snow covered up the grass with her great white cloak, and the frost painted all the trees silver. Then they invited the north wind to stay with them, and he came. 
He was wrapped in furs and he roared all day about the garden and blew the chimney pots down. This is a delightful spot, he said. We must ask the hail on a visit. So the hail came. And every day for three hours he rattled on the roof of the castle till he broke most of the slates. And then he ran around and around the garden as fast as he could. He was dressed in grey and his breath was like ice. I cannot understand why the spring is so late in coming, said the selfish giant as he sat at the window and looked out at his cold white garden. I hope there will be a change in the weather. But the spring never came, nor the summer. The autumn gave golden fruit to every garden, but to the giant's garden she gave none. He is too selfish, she said. So it was always winter there. And the north wind and the hail and the frost and the snow danced about through the trees. One morning, the giant was lying awake in bed when he heard some lovely music. It sounded so sweet to his ears that he thought it must be the king's musicians passing by. It was really only a little linnet singing outside his window. But it was so long since he'd heard a bird sing in his garden that it seemed to him to be the most beautiful music in the world. Then the hail stopped dancing over his head and the north wind ceased roaring and a delicious perfume came to him through the open casement. I, I believe the spring has come at last, said the giant, and he jumped out of bed and looked out. What did he see? He saw a most wonderful sight. Through a little hole in the wall, the children had crept in, and they were sitting in the branches of the trees. In every tree that he could see, there was a little child, and the trees were so glad to have the children back again that they had covered themselves with blossoms and were waving their arms gently above the children's heads. The birds were flying about and twittering with delight, and the flowers were looking up through the green grass and laughing. It was a lovely scene, only in one corner it was still winter. It was the farthest corner of the garden, and in it was standing a little boy. He was so small that he could not reach up to the branches of the tree, and he was wandering all around it, crying bitterly. The poor tree was still quite covered with frost and snow, and the north wind was blowing and roaring above it. Climb up, little boy, said the tree, climb up! And it bent its branches down as low as it could. But the boy was too tiny, and the giant's heart melted as he looked out. How selfish I have been, he said. Now I know why the spring would not come here. I will put that poor little boy on the top of the tree, and then I will knock down the wall, and my garden shall be the children's playground forever and ever. He was really very sorry for what he had done, so he crept downstairs, opened the front door quite softly, and went out into the garden. But when the children saw him, they were so frightened that they all ran away, and the garden became winter again. Only the little boy did not run, for his eyes were so full of tears that he did not see the giant coming. And the giant stole up behind him and took him gently in his hand and put him up into the tree. And the tree broke at once into blossom. And the birds came and sang on it. And the little boy stretched out his two arms and flung them around the giant's neck and kissed him. And the other children, when they saw that the giant was not wicked any longer, came running back. And with them came the spring. It is your garden now, little children, 
said the giant. And he took a great axe and knocked down the wall. And when the people were going to market at 12 o'clock, they found the giant playing with the children in the most beautiful garden they had ever seen. All day long they played, and in the evening they came to the giant to bid him goodbye. But where is your little companion, he said, the boy I put into the tree? The giant loved him the best because he had kissed him. We don't know, answered the children. He's gone away. You, you must tell him to be sure and come here tomorrow, said the giant. But the children said that they did not know where he lived and had never seen him before. And the giant felt very sad. Every afternoon when school was over, the children came and played with the garden. But the little boy whom the giant loved was never seen again. The giant was very kind to all the children, yet he longed for his first little friend and often spoke of him. How I would like to see him, he used to say. Years went over and the giant grew very old and feeble. He could not play about any more, so he sat in a huge armchair and watched the children at their games and admired his garden. I have many beautiful flowers, he said, but the children are the most beautiful flowers of all. One winter morning, he looked out of his window as he was dressing. He did not hate the winter now, for he knew that it was merely the spring asleep and that the flowers were resting. Suddenly, he rubbed his eyes in wonder and looked and looked. It certainly was a marvelous sight. In the farthest corner of the garden was a tree quite covered with lovely white blossoms. Its branches were all golden, and silver fruit hung down from them. And underneath it stood the little boy he had loved. Downstairs ran the giant in great joy, and out into the garden. He hastened across the grass and came near to the child. And when he came quite close, his face grew red with anger. And he said, Who hath dared to wound thee? For on the palms of the child's hands were the prints of two nails. And the prints of two nails were on the little feet. Who hath dared to wound thee? cried the giant. Tell me that I may take my big sword and slay him. Nay, answered the child. But these are the wounds of love. Who art thou? said the giant, and a strange awe fell on him, and he knelt before the little child. And the child smiled on the giant and said to him, You let me play once in your garden. Today you shall come with me to my garden which is paradise. And when the children ran in that afternoon, they found the giant lying dead under the tree, all covered with white blossoms. Let's just take a few minutes at our tables um, to just uh, try to see what God has for us in the story. So I invite you to just go to twos and threes maybe and discuss.